Thanks, everyone. Uh, welcome to How to Hack APIs in 15 Minutes or Less. Um, a little bit of background on, um, on the talk and myself. I, uh, my name is Igor Matlin. I work for this company called Data Theorem. Um, started out as a developer, wrote um, um, code. I'm sure some of it was good. Most of it was probably not so good. But I can tell you, back when I was writing code, we didn't really care about security at all, or very little, tiny bit, maybe. Um, trying, basically, keeping applications from crashing was the biggest uh, um, concern. But um, things changed, so I switched to application security maybe 12, about 12 years ago. Worked for a number of vendors running solutions architecture now at uh, Data Serum. The talk is about APIs, and, but specifically about mobile a applications and APIs that are used by mobile applications. It's kind of based on real events, or at least uh, the talk was inspired by real events, real hacks. So let's do it. Now, as I was preparing for the talk, right, I realized that the, the, the title is how to hack APIs in 15 minutes or less. But we have an hour here, right? <laughs> so what are we going to do for the other 45 minutes? Uh, so our marketing, marketing team to the rescue, they've created a very informative and fun presentation about our company and the products. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Not today, though, because obviously I'm not going to show any marketing slides, right? So yeah, yeah please don't leave. St stay, stay, stay there in the back. Hopefully, you'll enjoy it someday later. Okay. We don't even have marketing department at Data Theorem. So. But why 15 minutes? Right. That's because that's what usually hackers have. Right? They, don't, they, don't, they don't, they're not pen testers. You don't hire them for two people, two weeks on a project, right? They want to get in, grab something that's uh, easy to grab, and move on. Sure, there are some who will spend days and you know maybe months and years designing specific attack. SolarWind comes to mind, right? Probably a lot of preparation went into that one. But most hackers just want to get in, grab data, move on. So 15 minutes is, yeah, basically what they want to spend on your website, on your company assets, et cetera. All right, well, before uh, we're going to get into technical details, I just want to kind of make a distinction between hackers who hack for profit, for fame, for all of those things, and security researchers like us, right, who um, like probably some of you here in the Actually, that's a good, good question. How many of you consider yourself security researchers? OK. How many of you consider yourself hackers? Well, it's just good overlap, right? Good overlap. Yeah, yeah. yeah so maybe like, I don't care what color, color hat you wear, but um, you know, uh, researchers usually do it because you know, they, they, they like the challenge. It's an intellectual stimulation, right? For example, is uh, our board member, Dan Bonet, who's a professor at Stanford, famous guy. And um, researchers take time to do their work. All right, so uh, there's an interesting, very interesting uh, research. It's a link on my um, slides done by a group of researchers, so graduate <laughs> students from multiple universities. Right? on defeating machine learning and essentially self-driving cars, right? So what they uh, done is they placed, uh, strategically placed uh, little uh, pieces of uh, black tape around the stop sign. And that was sufficient to defeat a self-driving algorithm that, so that it doesn't recognize that as a stop sign anymore. Now, obviously, you know, you drive around, you probably would 
just shrug it off, and it is a stop sign to us, right? Machine learning, uh, it's not. And so it did take quite a bit to figure out how to poison machine learning model. Several years, years of research, actually, but quite an you know, interesting paper to read. Now, if I were a hacker, I really wouldn't care how to poison machine learning model. I'd just grab a stop sign, and go stand in the middle of uh, expressway. All right? Now, obviously, you and I driving, this is Southern California. Uh, I probably wouldn't last more than a couple minutes, get hit by a car, right? Nobody cares. Nobody's going to stop. But what would a self-driving car do? Stop in the middle of expressway? Maybe. They do recognize it as a stop sign. You know, it's not poison to anything, right? I don't recommend that you try it uh, in the middle of I-35 around here. I've seen people drive, so probably shouldn't. But um, also want to read a disclaimer that uh, any resemblances or logos or um, mentions of any company, particular one, whether it's self-driving or application, anything, it's purely coincidental, right? No real companies were harmed in the production of this presentation. Okay. But what, what, actually, how many of you do you think? Uh, how many of you think that um, a self-driving car would stop? If I, yeah, I mean, I think it's a reasonable assumption, right? It could, All right? So a hacker wouldn't really spend years on research. They would yeah, probably just go out and mess with others with the traffic. Uh, there was a, a very, I guess, uh, infamous case where a researcher loaded up a, uh, one of those kids' wagons with uh, Google phones and map, running maps, and just walked across the bridge so that um, Google Maps thinks that you know, it's traffic is stuck, right? All you have is just, just, just you know, you walk around the, and started rerouting, started rerouting people to, uh, to other bridges, right? But you know, that's that's hacker, right? You mess with other people, right? Or whatever it is, uh, whatever reason. Okay, so. Um, now, some of you might say, oops, that's too fast, that's too fast. Some of you might say, wait, wait, wait a second, Igor, wait a second. I'm sure Tesla and their self-learning algorithm, they know it's an expressway, right, 405. There are no stop signs in the expressway. So we're just going to ignore this guy standing with a stop sign, right? But uh, what about this situation, right? I'm, I'm from the Midwest. We uh, have construction season that starts in March and you know, goes through November probably, right? Lots of construction, lots of folks standing with either slow or stop. Well, you're supposed to stop, right? If you see a guy with a stop sign. Interesting, right? Maybe it doesn't have to be a stop sign. Maybe I can just do say, uh, say that, hey, it's 55 here, speed up. Or it's 25 here, slow down. Right? So all this kind of illustrates the, the, um, the point that hackers just want to mess with things, with uh, others. Easy to do, something simple, no. Um, uh, sophisticated research, typically. Yeah. Well, back to API security. It's, it's, yeah. We came here to, to actually um, hear about API security.
Now, when this talk was, um, um, was, was getting prepared, actually a couple of years ago, this was a real question, right? Is API secure, uh, hacking a real problem? It, it's more of a statement these days, right? We all know that uh, API is getting hacked on a regular basis. So um, hopefully, everybody knows that it's a big, huge attack vector for everyone, right? And so the answer is yes. But we used to you know, go back and forth um, in the conversations. But uh, as I mentioned, this talk is based on real events, real hacks. Here's one of them. So uh, a few years ago, um, our CEO, a former hacker, hacker uh, himself, noticed this pattern of uh, attacks on mobile apps. Uh, there's one um, hacker group that um, downloaded apps from Apple App Store, Google Play Store, reverse engineered them, extracted APIs, and basically tried them all. Nothing sophisticated. Um, now, of course, the reverse engineering of mobile apps happens all the time, right? There are legitimate reasons to do that. Researchers, company like ours, our competitors. Um, but um, hackers, these hackers just um, um, try everything that they could find in an app. So in this particular app, um, the APIs were not protected. Admin APIs were not protected. Uh, the, the application itself was um, was written in React Native, essentially JavaScript, easy to unpack when you get it. Um, you know, no credentials needed. You could just um, download the entire user database. And uh, you know, of course, every application user database is, is sensitive data. Uh, in this particular case, the app was uh, targeting conservative warriors. You know, you can probably I get a lot of information just by looking at the user list. It's of course, um, email addresses, names, etc. So that's what March 2019. A few months later, another mobile app was hacked. In this case, um, an event planning uh, app in Australia. I almost tripped, and it's. Seven minutes, right? Uh, so, you, you know, event planning app used by university students, right? Again, very similar attack. A search API embedded or used by the mobile app uh, could basically used to get information on any user. You could say search users starting with A, it would give you back a list of um, um, all the users whose usernames start with A. You can go on. There was no rate limiting on the API either. So quick script, you have the entire user database at your disposal. Two months later, another app, this time dating app, right? plenty of fish. I've never used it. I've been married for too long. But uh, apparently, it's uh, pretty popular. Right, obviously, dating app, you know, your preferences, uh, or maybe you don't even want to be associated with a dating app. Right? So, in that case, the API response included way more information about the user that um, was necessary. The app itself did the filtering and wouldn't show it, right? Um, all you know, all the preferences, pictures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the hacking group wasn't using mobile client, calling API directly. Right. Now, there's no sophisticated hack here. Just you know, look at the APIs, call the APIs, you're done. Now. If you look at uh, OWASP API top 10, right? what's number one? 
The number one hack uh, attack is uh, BOLA, broken object level authorization. So that requires you to kind of see what data is available to one user, make sure it's not available to another user. I, I cannot get a list of your orders. You cannot get a list of my invoices, etc. That's an interesting attack. And there are some um, pretty uh, you know, I don't know, known vulnerabilities of BOLA kind as well. But um, at most, you typically get access to like maybe one or two users, maybe a dozen users' data. That's not a breach, right? With things that are far less sophisticated, such as an API just lacking um, authentication or authorization protection, right? Or excessive data exposure, like in the previous case, you can get access to the entire user base. Thousands, tens of thousands of records. That's a definition of a data breach. That's something that has to be uh, reported, or you know, if you don't report it and you try to hide it, bad things would happen to you as a CISO, right? as we learned uh, a few weeks ago. So whereas BOLA is pretty cool, the number two and number three on the list are a lot more dangerous, a lot easier to exploit. And that's you know, APIs not protected by authentication or unauthenticated APIs. and um, excessive data exposure. So now that we've kind of looked at what happened, let's uh, look at how that happened. Now, there will be some kind of names and again, um, uh, companies uh, there, but um, we're not picking a on a particular company, everybody has vulnerabilities, so it's pure, purely for illustrative purposes. Right? So step one is to download an app from the app or Play Store and decrypt it. Now it's easier, much easier to do with Android apps. It's a little harder to do with iOS apps, but it's still pretty easy to do. Even though Apple does have a DRM protection, uh, there are a number of tools that can uh, yeah, uh, defeat it. And so get a real app. You can then reverse engineer it and actually I'm going to do a live demo. Yeah, I'm gonna go, not going to do the live demo of the decryption because that actually requires a device, a jailbroken device in most cases. I'm going to do that. But we'll, we'll do um, a live demo of uh, subsequent steps. So um, we have a, um, a small, very short Python program. Make it available to everybody to download after the uh, presentation. Um, that essentially goes through the application and extracts everything that looks like an API call. Okay. So uh, again, any um, names are coincidental. All right, Python 3, API. So we have um, kind of apps from different years, right? 2019, 2020, 2022. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to grab um, APIs from 2019. That's it, right? Mm 
right? Demos never go uh, well. But there you go, right? To see that there's a, a kind of bunch of um, apps, uh, of API calls back to the parent company, probably you know, to actually in, 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 uh, to uh, perform the functions of the app. Uh, you know, some other built-in SDKs, analytics reportings, whatever it is. It's a bunch of APIs, right? We did that, right? Now, the secret sauce to the 15-minute hack, though, isn't that you get a long list of APIs, and, and some applications can have dozens, or maybe even hundreds of different APIs. Calling all those might take time. <laughs> the secret sauce to the 15-minute hack is to compare two different versions of the app and only attack the change. So what the, turned out, what the, what the actual hacker group did wasn't just looking at all the APIs. They would download a version, save a list of APIs in that version, wait for an update, and get the delta. And the delta eh, could be maybe two, three, five, whatever the changes developers done in that period. But why do you think those are a lot more interesting to try? Because developers may or may not have told the AppSec guys about the new APIs, right? I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add some. I mean, we, we used to have get. I'll just, use a, I'll just add a patch because, you know, Product people told me that you need to be able to modify user data. Well, I'll just use I'll just do a patch application, and I don't tell anybody. I release it. You have something that's not been tested. You have something that's not been secured. We call these APIs shadow APIs because they are kind of kind of sneak into the product, bypassing traditional controls. It happens all the time. And so, as a hacker, again, I just want to do this uh, pretty quickly, right? So I'll um, go in and out. I'll test three or four APIs instead of 30, 40, 100 APIs. So let's go back to our Python script. And let, oh, so actually, so all these APIs are saved in the APIs.json file. So I'm going to. to uh, 2019, oops, and I can type and look that JSON, right? And I'm going to repeat the process on the 2022. There you go. It's a longer list, actually. So we have a, a pretty simple, again, Python script, I don't know, 20 lines of code that uh, compares the, the um, uh, where is it? It's a long list, the long, uh, I hear the long command type, compares the two. Oh, wait. <coughs> Um, actually, you know, I need to need to copy uh, move APIs that JSON to APIs twenty twenty two dot JSON and then run. I knew it.
right. But it has a, a USB-C to HDMI adapter. <sighs> Shows extend this desktop. Okay. Woo. All right, so Shadow API Hunter, right, does a diff between the two. What did I do? Oh, well, yeah, so quick, right? So all these APIs are new. Now, we've compared 2019 to 2022. Obviously, Delta is pretty big. Uh, but if you compare something like from May to August, the Delta, like I said, may be just a few entries. Right? Now, what do we do afterwards? We just try uh, the APIs. Right? If we get 200, uh, we're good, right? It's a success. Uh, without any sort of authentication. We just connect to APIs and try to extend, ex extract data, see what, what comes back. 200 is good. I mean, some sort of redirection, if it redirects to um, a 200 response, that's also good. Uh, obviously, anything in the 400 uh, is probably not good. So, and essentially, you can do a curl, right? But since we're not doing it manually, we can do yeah. oh, here it is. So it's going to run, kind of do this connection. Um, um, and give us a list of um, successes. There you go. So it's successfully connected to all these APIs without. What is going on? Why does it keep happening to me? I knew I should have uh, brought my Chromebook instead, right? We have a guy from AV. No, have a have an adapter by chance? USB-C to uh, HDMI. Yeah, looks like. Oh, you have one. I'm going to tape. I'm oh, tape you're going to tape this? Oh, you think it's moving along? Yeah. Moving it's around. Oh, thank you. Let's see if, if that works better. You're not recording no. any of this, right? No. <laughs> uh, maybe it's my. Oh, you try a different port. All right. Shh. All right. Extract data. Now, so to recap, decrypt, com uh, extract APIs, extract shadow APIs, connect to the delta, to the shadow APIs, extract data, uh, profit. 
I suppose. You know, so um, yeah, APIs are a little different from you know scanning for ports, right? Back in I don't know year two thousand, what would hackers do, right? Just go and do nmap scan of every computer they can find, hit something on you know eighty four three thirty three eighty nine whatever the ports are, right? Known, Well-known ports. You kind of know what to expect from that um, port response. The API is different, right? You can't really guess the API um, path. Yeah, they're not, well, GraphQL APIs have schemas and maybe some other, um, you, can, you can get the, the uh, schemas for those. But for REST, REST APIs are not, don't have to be described anywhere. And it's nice if the company publishes you know, swagger spec or something like that. But you know, they don't have to. And they can add a new method without telling anyone. Right? Obviously, exact, extremely simple to automate. Right? You can hit the top 1,000 apps or top 10,000 apps in the App Store uh, probably with a simple script in a few hours writing this. So each takes even less than 15 minutes. Um, now that hacker group actually got a, got a 30 to 35 hits doing just that from the apps in the mobile store. That's pretty good payback, I think. Yeah. All right, we'll already walk through this. So that's your connect to API kind of workflow. You know, status code redirects, server errors, not good. 200 is good. All right. Some bonus material, since we're actually uh, running a little bit ahead. Right? Um, I promised um, 45 minutes of filter, filler. Now I'm going to do 45 minutes of filler. But actually, um, we're going to talk about doing something very similar but with uh, cloud storage. Now, how do you find cloud storage? Um, I can't really just connect to some AWS account and, and look for S3 buckets, right? You can just, I, I cannot log in and look for S3 buckets in your AWS account. Now, sounds familiar? There's a mobile app that actually uh, was connecting to an Elasticsearch database right from the mobile app. And the Elasticsearch database was not protected by anything other than obscurity. Because, well, it's a mobile app, right? Nobody. You know, it's protected by DRM, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's not, right? So similar technique uh, as with APIs can be used to discover uh, storage assets in the cloud. And of course, you know, where, do, where else would you keep your customer data? Cloud, because right? it's easy to grow, um, easy to stand up. All right. So, um, no password, and I know where to I know where to access which which you know you're all too used to access the database. Interesting. It, interestingly, though, this wasn't one of the big three cloud providers. Not AWS, not Azure, not GCP. It was a digital ocean, but. As the as they always say, right? Protecting um, storage buckets, storage assets with a password is your responsibility, not the cloud provider's responsibility. Right? So there's a separation duties. A few months later, another application with the same story. In this case, Alibaba. Alibaba? How do you pronounce it anyway? Again, 
uh, no password, um, public access to the storage bucket. Um, all you have to do is reverse engineer. Yeah. Finally, AWS Cloud Storage. Same story. Now, there's a lot of cases like that, but no sophisticated hacks. You extract a URL, you connect to URL, and see what you get. I just, yeah, there's all, all, over 40, and I think um, cases like that keep coming. Um, for whatever reason, the mobile teams, in our experience at least, seem to operate by different rules from other development teams. In uh, many organizations, mobile applications are outsourced. Uh, maybe, I don't know, there are fewer uh, engineers available to run iOS and Android apps. Um, anybody wants to share experiences with uh, your organizations? How does um, how do mobile developers differ from, I guess, server developers or web? They go faster. Go faster. Yeah. You go fast, you kind of cut corners. Go faster. Maybe uh, um, SDLC is a bit less mature. Um, I actually, um, in our kind of practice, we talk to teams that, um, you know, that develop uh, mobile apps, you know, that Ethereum is big in mobile security. I actually hear uh, teams that don't have a good CI CD. They do releases manually. I don't think I've ever heard that happening with uh, server apps or web apps in the last 10 years. Like uh, the idea of somebody downloading, cloning, you know, a, a, your, your repository locally, building on my workstation, and sending in production, I don't think it happens anymore in, in the majority of, of the world, but it does happen in mobile. So um, maybe that's why we continue to see um, vulnerabilities in mobile apps. Right? Very similar process, right? Now, what else can you find in the application? You can find keys and passwords in the application. Um, yeah, it probably happens in the web apps as well, in the um, server code as well. It happens in mobile all the time. So for example, there's uh, three keys that, let's say, we find in an app. Let's uh, do some um, Q&A. So the first one is obviously a password. And secret, maybe not so secret. Can you guys see it from the back? Um, it's not probably not very clear, but uh, the first one is a password. Well, secret password for blah, blah, blah. The second you know, is a long key. And the third looks like a Twitter API key. So um, how would you rank it from most critical to least critical? A Twitter API key is probably the least critical key. Right? Because all, all it, in most cases, all it does, it lets you read publicly available feed anyway. Right? The password, password is bad. If, um, um, yeah, if, it, if it's a password to your own account, it's bad, but not too bad because it's a single record. But the middle one starts with AI, blah, 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 is probably an AWS uh, secret. Now that could be a ticket to, uh, to the entire user database. Um, so. Keys are bad, not all are equally bad, but it's uh, 
typically something that you find in the app. And again, does not require a lot of sophisticated hacks. Now, this is an AppSec conference, not hacker conference. So we really should talk about solutions. Um, it is the last slide, of, uh, almost the last slide of, of the presentation. So maybe we should have talked about it earlier. But um, I mean, let's talk about it. So detect shadow APIs, right? That is a, a big issue. Inventorying your APIs is a big issue. Um, so pay attention to that. Um, and it applies to mobile, applies to web, of course, as well. But um, as we just discussed, mobile might be a bigger problem today. Check anything unauthenticated um, for any API or other sensitive information. There are legitimate reasons to have APIs without authentication, right? But uh, those should be far and few in between, right? Few and far in between, one of those. Right? Why? Because uh, it's easy to, again, include inadvertently something that shouldn't be um, included in, a, in an authenticated API call. So always review what's unauthenticated. Checks for keys and tokens. And uh, always check open uh, storage or op open cloud storage for PI. Um, cloud storage, again, there are legitimate reasons to have open cloud storage. Um, you might you know, keep um, I don't know, images or some other static data in there, uh, CDM, uh, kind of essentially cloud storage. But you always need to make sure that there's no PI in there. Test daily is what we usually tell folks. So some of the tools we discussed today, um, my email, happy to provide these uh, Python scripts. Uh, once you get them, you'll kind of see that they're fairly trivial. Right? Again, hacker tools, not security research tools. Um, uh, we also have a, a, a similar tool, Python tool, that uh, takes um, a browser uh, network traffic uh, history R file and converts, extracts API from, from there as well. Didn't get a chance to demo, but um, it works in a very similar um, idea. Questions? How are we doing? 15 minutes, good. Okay. Who's going to go hunt uh, for shadow APIs now in, in your own company? That's very naughty. Is that? Uh, <laughs> After 5 p.m. today? Um. Yeah, so I have a question. So, I mean, you're showing a couple of scripts and commands to, to uh, extract this data. So would, it, would you say it would be feasible to build an automated service that downloaded from App Store to play versions as they get uploaded, do all this manually, and then sort of get, bring out a report saying this is the best possible basis to pack. And then you kept cutting down your 15 minutes even more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we just, uh, um, I, I'm sure for any real, real hack, oh, I'm sorry, the question, I don't know if you heard it, would it be possible to automate all these manual steps and uh, automatically get updates from Google App, uh, Play Store, Apple App Store as new versions are released? Yeah, absolutely. That's um, uh, probably how I would go about it, right? I mean, I. Nobody wants to type things um, from command line, but um, yeah, it's it's pretty trivial, and you can, yeah, you know, use cloud infrastructure to do that. Uh, bring it up, uh, have things as needed. Yeah, absolutely. You don't need to. There are sites out there that automatically grab all apps and put in all the rooms. Yeah, you can you can go to APK for for. Um, um, 
what is that site, APK something something for all the Androids and they're all versions. You can you don't have to wait for next version. You can just go and um, mm -hmm. download all the previous versions and do comparison. They, I mean, the, the older you go, obviously, the less chances of that API being untested, right? Because um, yeah, there's there, there are bug bounty programs, and so um, um, a lot of these applications eventually get tested by both um, malicious hackers and, and uh, well-meaning bug bounty researchers or bug bounty hackers, I guess. But yeah, so the, the key is to, to grab a new version as soon as it's released. But yeah, it's fairly trivial. You can sign up for notifications through uh, Play, Play Store and App Store. Just be notified. All right, I'll uh, give you 10 minutes back. Thank you for uh, you know, sitting through all the technical difficulties. And um, good luck with uh, API hunting. <laughs>